Welcome to my classroom. I am Nisli. In this video, I shall try to explain the slow action potential in the heart. We know that the heart cells can produce two different types of action potentials, fast and slow. The fast action potential is produced by the atrial and ventricular muscle cells and the conduction cells of the heart, the Purkinje cells. We see here an atrial fast action potential and a ventricular one. The one that we observe in the Purkinje is very much like the one in the ventricle. We can see that the depolarization phase of a fast action potential is very steep. This is because the depolarization is produced by voltage-gated sodium channels that open and close very quickly. And the result is that the depolarization phase is very steep. The second action potential is the slow action potential. It's produced especially in the sinoatrial and atrioventricular nodal cells. And if the physiological conditions are changed, it is possible to obtain slow action potential also in the Purkinje cells. Here is a slow action potential recorded from the sinoatrial node. We can see that the depolarization phase is less steep compared to the fast action potential. This is because the depolarization phase is produced by voltage-gated calcium channels that open and close slowly, and the result is that the depolarization phase is less steep. If we have a look at the <coughs> Uh, production of these action potentials in time relative to the cardiac cycle. If we combine the electrical activities with the mechanical activities in the heart, what do we see? The uh, sinoatrial node produces an action potential. It spreads to the atria. We see the action potential in the atria. We know that this is accompanied by atrial contraction and this is the end part of diastole. Atrial systole is a piece of diastole because when we say diastole and systole without mentioning where it is, we mean that it is in the ventricles. So diastole and atrial contraction happens, the end of diastole, and then the electrical activity spreads to the ventricles and a little after the depolarization, the ventricular muscle starts to contract. A little after the uh, ventricular repolarization, ventricular muscle relaxes. So this period is the systole. After that, we see that the atrial and ventricular muscle cells have a constant resting membrane potential, and this is the beginning of diastole. Until a new uh, action potential comes out from the sinoatrial node and the diastole is completed with this. If we have a look at these action potentials, we see that the resting membrane potential in the atrial and ventricular muscle cells are constant. So it's about minus 80 or minus 90 millivolt. But there is no constant resting membrane potential in the cells that produce the slow action potential. There is a maximum negative level that is produced on the membrane at the end of repolarization and it is called maximum diastolic potential. So after the maximum diastolic potential, the membrane potential in these cells gradually depolarize all by themselves automatically to reach the threshold and produce a slow action potential. Um, Sinoatrial nodal cells and atrioventricular nodal cells are pretty small. With the technology we have today, it is not easy to get reliable results, reliable recording from such small cells. So the researchers have found a solution to this. It is converting the Purkinje cells from fast action potential to slow action potential cell. This means that the Purkinje cells have the ion channels that are responsible for the slow wave, 
slow action potential and the fast action potential. In under physiological conditions, they use the machinery for fast action potential. But if we change the physiological conditions, we can block the voltage-gated sodium channels, and when they are blocked, the Purkinje cells are going to produce a slow action potential. What are these conditions? If we increase the extracellular fluid concentration of potassium, or if we place tetrodotoxin to our medium, then we block the voltage-gated sodium channels. Tetrodotoxin is a poison that blocks the uh, voltage-gated sodium channels. So, under these conditions, we can convert the Purkinje cells to slow-action potential production, and we can observe the uh, ion channels or ion currents that work in that. Now let us have a look at the ion channels that produce the slow wave. So, after a maximum diastolic depolarization, which is approximately minus 60 millivolt, the cell gradually depolarizes to minus 50 millivolt, the threshold of the action potential. So, the change here from minus 60 to minus 50 is called a pacemaker potential. Pacemaker means determining the rate of the heart. Or, in, it has other names like prepotential, diastolic depolarization, phase 4 depolarization. Um, what are the ion currents that produce this? Um, the first one we can talk about is IF, funny current. It's called a funny current because the, the channels that produce this current open of with the hyperpolarization. Most of the channels, voltage-gated sodium, excuse me, voltage-gated ion channels that we know until today are opening upon depolarization of the cell uh, membrane potential. But here, after the end of the repolarization, it is said that we reach a maximum hyperpolarization level, which is the maximum diastolic potential. So this hyperpolarization opens the channels for the funny current. That's, it's also called hyperpolarization induced current. And because it's hyperpolarization induced, it's called funny current at the same time. The channels for the funny current open and they are permeable to both sodium and potassium. But at the minus 60 millivolt membrane potential level, the electrochemical net driving force on sodium is bigger than that on potassium. So the sodium current here is bigger and sodium current is more important. Sodium goes into the cell and starts the polarizing the cell and it starts the prepotential. Another theory based on the results of experiments is here. It, it, this theory depends on a balance between potassium efflux and sodium influx. The potassium efflux here is produced by the repolarization and IB current, the sodium influx, is produced by some ion channels that are open all the time. They are not voltage dependent, on, they, are not, they are not time dependent. So maybe I can call them the leak channels. So there is a constant sodium influx. But during the repolarization phase, the potassium efflux is a lot. So the importance of the sodium influx is taken away and potassium efflux is more important. But towards the end of repolarization, this potassium efflux decreases and the balance moves towards the side of IB current for sodium. So at the end of repolarization, the IB current becomes relatively more important and sodium influx through these channels also contributes to the prepotential, the depolarization. The next step is further on the prepotential. Uh, after the depolarization formed by the first events that we talked about, the threshold for T-type voltage-gated calcium channels is reached. 
what is the difference of T-type voltage-gated calcium channels from the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels that we are familiar with? Um, the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels are responsible for the depolarization phase of the slow action potential and the plateau phase of the fast action potential. Um, they are long-lasting. The T-type channels are transient, which means that they open and close quickly. They open for a very short period of time compared to the L-type, transient T. So the, when the, with the effect of funny current and IB current, we reach the threshold of T-type voltage-gated calcium channels. They open, calcium goes in, and this influx of calcium keeps moving the prepotential towards the threshold. Some researchers believe that although there may, they may be few in number, some voltage-gated sodium channels also contribute to the uh, prepotential. The third uh, thing, the third uh, ion channel that we can talk about is the L-type of calcium channels, but these are different from the usual L-type of calcium channels that we know. That's why I have placed an exclamation mark here. These have been discovered more recently. These channels, the difference from the usual ones that we know is that they have a threshold which is more negative compared to the normal ones. Just like the T-type voltage-gated calcium channels, the, the special L-type calcium channels have a threshold at more negative values, so they can contribute to the prepotential. And the last piece that I can talk about is the effect of sodium-calcium exchanger. And here is the theory put together by researchers. So we know that sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to release calcium by the opening of calcium-gated calcium channels. So we know that, we also know that sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium from the cystana, and the cystana of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is very close to the membrane of the cell. So the calcium that is released from sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to increase the concentration of the calcium locally just next to the inner side of the membrane. And this is going to trigger the activity of sodium-calcium exchanger. Sodium-calcium exchanger is going to send out one calcium every time it works, which means two positive charges, and every time it works in return for the calcium, it is going to bring in three sodium ions, which means three positive charges. So. With the action of sodium-calcium exchanger, there is a net input of sodium, positive charges, which is going to help the depolarization. There is a lot of information here, and even in addition to this, scientists believe that there may be very small ion currents that we are not able to measure by the technology of today still contributing to the prepotential. The reason why they think so is that the distance between the maximum diastolic pressure and the threshold is only 10 millivolt. It is relatively small compared to the similar level at the atrial and ventricular cells. The resting membrane potential there is minus 90 millivolt and the threshold is about 50 millivolts. It's a big distance between the membrane poten resting membrane potential and the threshold. So the researchers believe that because the distance here is smaller, the excitability of these cells are higher. So small currents may be present even there to help the, this depolarization that make us reach the threshold in a slow action potential. So these currents may be so small that we may not be able to measure them by the technology we have in hand today. So when we reach the threshold, the action potential is going to start. The polarization of the action potential is produced by our usual L-type voltage-gated calcium channels and 
the repolarization phase is produced by someone familiar, delayed rectifier potassium channels, which are also responsible for the repolarization in the action potentials of the nerves and in the fast action potentials. So, with the delayed rectifier potassium channels, potassium efflux brings us to the maximum diastolic pressure and this is going to trigger the hyperpolarization induced current and IB current and a new cycle is going to start. <clears throat> One last thing before we finish our video that I can mention is that uh, some researchers have believe that sodium-potassium ATPA's activity level may be modulating the maximum diastolic pressure, potential, maximum diastolic potential. So, sodium-potassium ATPA's may be affecting the excitability of the cell by modulating the maximum diastolic potential. I have tried to explain the slow action potential of the heart I hope it has been useful. Thank you for watching.